nobody likes you. Nobody likes you. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we say thank you. Thank you that you're in this place. Thank you that you're moving in this place. We thank you, Lord, just in these last few minutes for just reminding us how good you are and how good you've been to us. God, we declare right now on this fourth Sunday in February that there's nobody like you. Nobody hears prayers like you. Nobody answers prayers like you. Nobody heals like you. Nobody delivers like you. Nobody makes a way like you. Nobody gives grace like you. Nobody gives mercy like you. There's nobody like you. And we declare it this day in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the chains that are about to be broken. We thank you, Lord, for the deliverance that's about to take place. We thank you, Lord, for the salvation that's about to be handed out right now. Thank you. Thank you. We thank you. I thank you, Lord, that right now somebody who came in this place with a heavy heart is going to leave out in victory. I thank you, Lord, somebody been sick all week long, Lord, is about to feel better right now. I thank you for a permanent healing that's about to take place. I thank you for a relationship that's about to be mended. I thank you, Lord, for the joy that's about to come out and come to somebody's sorrow for your heart. Thank you, Lord. All because you're in this place. If you preach out now, God, fill him up, Holy Spirit. Prepare our hearts and minds now, Lord, for spiritual surgery on all of us and each of us. Have your way, Lord. Have your way in us. Have your way in this place. Help us not to hold back nothing, but give you all the praise and glory you so rightfully deserve. In the name of Jesus. Can we just say Jesus for a minute? In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. The name that is above every name. In the name of Jesus. The only name by which we may be saved. In the name of Jesus, we bow down before your presence right now, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let some saved folks say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's give God some praise. Let's give God some praise. If you know God is good.
Ain't happening. Now go ahead and mark that place. And also mark Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. Put a piece of paper, put your finger, a little string in your Bible over there. We're going to read both. We're going to work out of one. Amen. Amen. Mark. Matthew chapter 8 and Luke chapter 7. Now if you got both of them, say amen. amen. If you need a few more minutes, say hold one second. Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him. And he said, Lord, my servant lies at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go and he goeth, and to another come and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them that followed, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. Now, for just one second, whip over to chapter 7 of Matthew, Luke. This was my intent when I woke up and the Lord moved us moved us about 8 o'clock this morning. Verse chapter 7 of Luke verse 1 says, Now when he ended all of his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum and a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, look what he says, when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. Here's what they said. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, don't trouble thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. But say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having set unto me soldiers, and I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned him about, and said unto the people that follow him, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And verse 10 says, And they that were sent returning to the house, they found the servant whole that had been sick. Turn to your neighbor and say, Neighbor, on this walk with the Lord, what you got to have is faith. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Go ahead and turn back to chapter 8, because that's where we're going to do most of our work from today. But as we have sojourned here in the very beginning of this year, we've dealt with and studied and evaluated the necessity for the children of God to not only... Uh, to walk with God, but to allow God to order our steps. Every step we take, we have to trust God to move us from where we are to where he wants to be. Uh, the first thing the child of God must understand that all of us have a destination. All of our ultimate destination is in the presence of the Lord. But all of our journeys will be different in getting to our destinations. That's it one time. All of us got a destination. We're walking this walk through this world to go to the place where we get to be with the Lord forever. But all of our journeys will be different in getting to our destination. 
And likewise, as a result of this reality, we must all understand that it's incumbent upon us not to see what somebody else is doing or what somebody else is going through, but instead allow God to order our steps. I believe when we look at this place today, all of us have gotten where we are because God brought us where we are. But all of us have come this way by a variety of methods. Some of us have come from one place and some of us have come from another place. Some of us have come through one thing and some of us can come through something else. But all of us have arrived where we are because God brought us here. But in order to get where God wants us to go, in order to enjoy our journey, we have to allow God to order our steps. Now we have understood that in order for God to order our steps, we got to be obedient to God. In other words, you can't allow God to order your steps and then do what you want to do because that means you're not allowing God to do what? Order your steps. But in addition to not being obedient to God, we have to have faith in God to get where God wants us to go and get there how he wants us to get there. Let me say this one more time. In order to really experience our walk with the Lord, we have to have faith in God so that we can experience what he is doing in our lives. Sometimes we're so focused on what's going on around us, we miss out on what God is doing for us. Many of us look back and try to figure out how we got well and how we got stronger, how we got a house or how we got a car. But it wasn't nobody but the Lord. But some of us were fretting the whole time. We missed out on experiencing the joy of the Lord in our lives. Well, in our text for today, in both of our texts, in the book of Matthew and the book of Luke, we began to see uh, some of the elements to allowing faith to have its way in our lives. In other words, all of us who are saved have a deposit of faith by the Holy Spirit that's in us, but it's a whole other thing to walk by faith and not by sight. To walk by faith and not by sight, you have to have an unequivocal trust and faith in God that God is going to do what God promises to do, and you got to walk like you believe God is able. In our text for today, in the book of Matthew chapter 8, we see that it's come at the very end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount for several days, even weeks. Jesus has preached the kingdom principles to those people who gathered around him. His disciples were there and many others who had followed him gathered there in chapters 5 through chapter 7 of Matthew to understand what kingdom principles were, what a kingdom of God was like here in this world. That it was not about self, but it was about God. It was not about self-aggrandizement. It was about focus on the Lord. It was not about getting the upper hand on somebody else. It was about allowing God to fix it however he chooses to fix it. And so for all those days, Jesus preached a sermon on the mount. But beginning in chapter 8, we see Jesus began to show what his power and authority really looks like. Let me put it together. In chapters 4 through 7, there was a kingdom principle revival. In chapters 8 through chapters 12, we see the kingdom principles acted out in the life of Jesus. In other words, what God wants us to understand, as we live according to his kingdom principles, his power will be manifest in our lives. In other words, you can't make God do nothing, but if you live the way God wants you to live, God will do what he promises to do in your life. Look at chapter 8. Look at chapter 8. The Bible starts, it very, it starts very clearly. Uh, first of all, demonstrating uh, Jesus' willingness to touch folk who didn't nobody want else to want to touch. And let me take a station break here and let you know here in the Word of God, in the world today, it's very important for us to understand that the church is Jesus' call to action with feet on it. In other words, what we are supposed to do is not what the world tells us we should or should not do. We're to do what Jesus did during his earthly ministry. In chapter 8, the first few verses, we see that there was a man with leprosy. This man with leprosy came to Jesus, and as a result of coming to Jesus, he was made clean. But what we see in this miraculous uh, example of Jesus' power, we see Jesus do what would nobody else do and what could nobody else do. Can I say that right there? We see Jesus do what nobody else would do and nobody else could do. What did Jesus do? He laid hands on a man with leprosy. Nobody else wanted to touch that man. Nobody else wanted to be made unclean by that man. Nobody else was willing to help that man. And Jesus was willing to do it. But the other thing is, could nobody else really do nothing no way? If anybody else had laid hands on him, nothing would have happened. But Jesus not only was willing to do it, guess what? He was able to change that man's life. And what are you trying to say about Pastor? What I'm trying to say is the church is here in this world to do what Jesus has done. Our work is to put hands on folk that won't nobody else buy. Our work is to touch folk that won't nobody else touch. Our work is to connect with folk who don't nobody want to connect with. And the reality is because of the power of God operating in us as a body of believers, guess what? Lives will be changed. 
had a conversation with the pastor and we were talking about church growth, church development, and, and he was talking about, uh, you know, so-and-so church over there, uh, folk leaving, now I'm going to try to get some of the folk. He said, what you going to do, Tom? And I said, it's a whole lot of folk don't know the Lord already out there. And I, I want to get that. That's who we need to be reaching. Some folk who don't know the Lord no way. Some folk who have never had contact with Jesus. Some folk who never have heard the good news of the gospel of Christ. That's who we ought to be reached. When you're at your job, when you're at your family, when you're at your friends, always understand that there's somebody out there who ain't saved. And let your message of salvation be to somebody who has never heard it before. Jesus has touched folk. Jesus will minister to folk who have never been ministered before. Now we see Jesus in this first miracle touch somebody. But in the second uh, event, in chapter 8, verse uh, verses 5 through 13, we see something else began again to happen. I want to take up my time here. The Bible says that Jesus came to Capernaum. That was Jesus' home base in Galilee. And he came there, and while he was there, uh, he had an encounter with the Roman centurion. Now, Matthew tells us that the centurion came to him. Uh, Luke lets us know that the centurion had sent for Jesus, and he found himself meeting Jesus halfway uh, between Jesus' journey from where he was to where the centurion was. Now, what I want to clarify about that is, the reality is, is that this Roman centurion had heard about Jesus. Y'all saw Luke say that. He had heard about Jesus. He had heard that Jesus could heal the sick. He had heard that Jesus could change now because he heard about Jesus. He got a group of Jews together and said, can y'all go and get me a meeting with that man? Let me tell somebody, that's why it's important for us not to stay on the down low about Jesus. We got to declare Jesus to a dying world. Because how else would they hear about Jesus if the church don't tell them about Jesus? How else can your co-worker come to be saved if you don't tell them about Jesus yourself? How else can somebody come to know the Lord? I told y'all this story one time. I'm going to tell you one more time. There, there was a man that worked at, a, at, a, at, a, at an auto plant. And for 23 years, he worked side by side with a man. They worked together. They took breaks together. They had lunch together. For 23 years, they worked together. And, and, and one morning, Monday morning, the man came in and told his friend, he said, look here, I want you to know that I got saved. And the man looked at him and said, I'm so glad. He said, I've been saved all my life since I was a little boy. And he looked him there in the face. He said, you've been knowing about Jesus all this time, and you never told me about him? He said, what kind of friend are you? And some of us are guilty of being that same way. We know Jesus. We come to church on Sunday morning, but we don't want to tell somebody who's standing right next to us how good God is. Here he is right here. Centurion heard about Jesus. He got some leaders of the Jews together and said, can you go and get me a meeting with Jesus? And so Luke lets us know that he, they take off and they go and they get Jesus and they tell Jesus, look here, there's a man who wants to talk to you. And this man, and I find it interesting that the Jews said this, he is worthy of your help. That's what they said. He has been good to us. He's built us a synagogue. He is worthy of your help. And so Jesus, in his willingness to help, because he had just finished helping this man with leprosy, he was showing kingdom principles. Jesus, the Savior of the world, said, I will go and help him. I want you to think about that for a second. Jesus, him who was in the beginning, him who was the word made flesh and dwell among us, him who was in the very beginning of the world, was willing to go and help somebody. Now, some of us, if we can heal somebody, we want everybody to come to us. I know what I'm talking about now. I know, I know. If we had the ability to heal, we wouldn't be walking around hospitals. We'd be posted up somewhere waiting on folk to come to us so that we could perhaps lay hands on them if we were in the mood. But Jesus said, let me go and heal. Uh, and it wasn't so much because the Jews said it. It was because Jesus wanted to change somebody's life. It ain't up to us to decide who we minister to. It's a response to what God is calling us to do. St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church can't sit here and say, we're not going to help this group, but we're going to help this group. Everybody God sends our way, guess what? We got a responsibility to reach out with the powerful hands of God that is in us and, and try to help somebody. Jesus comes to this man. He's on the way. But this man had an interesting response. I think this is, these are the significant points for us today to understand activated faith. He was coming. Picture this. 
Jesus is on the way to this centurion's house. The centurion heard that he was on the way. He did not sit in his den in his big comfortable chair and wait on Jesus. He did not go to his kitchen table and gather all of his folk around him and say, here come this Jew, let's see what he's going to do. He got up and he went to meet Jesus. He understood unequivocally that for a Jew to go into a Gentile's home and make them ceremonial and clean, and he did not want in any form or fashion to show any level of disrespect to Jesus. And as a result, he said, it's not that I don't want him in my house, I just don't think my house is worthy of him coming into. In order for you to really have faith in God, you got to be humble in every aspect of your life. You can't be full of yourself and expect God to move in your life. You got to be broken and humble, not just when situations get bad, but all the time. All the time. And, and, and this is what I've learned over 50 years, about 51 years, a couple of days. In 51 years, what I've learned is that you ain't got to have nothing to be cocky. You ain't got to have nothing to be arrogant. Some folk, if, if you were sitting here today and you saying, if I had this, I could do it, guess what? You arrogant. It is not until we realize that we are nothing and that God is everything and who we are is predicated upon what God does. It's not until we are that broken point where God can really do something in our world. Humility. This man was awful. He said, okay, let me just, I, I'm not worthy that you should come in my house. I am not, I just, I, I'm just, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, just not, I'm, I'm just not worthy. I'm not worthy. We've got to understand our lack of worthiness before a holy God. The God we serve is holy. Would, would everybody agree that he's holy? He's a holy God. And, and no matter how good you think you've done, guess what? God is holy. And we're still not worthy. And, and so every day of our lives ought to begin with the reality and the declaration that I'm not worthy of any of your blessings. I'm grateful for all that you are doing. Uh, Roman soldier, the Roman servant, but had authority because he was a, a, a officer in an occupying army. That's what he was. And so I'm sure that the folk around him were shocked. When they heard these words, because he was supposed to be puffed up and full of himself, even as he waited on Jesus to do a miracle in his life. Some of us are puffed up, but got the nerve to want to ask God to make a move, and I'm like, God, deliver me from this, but we like this. God wants us to be broken. This man was broken. She said, you know, I'm not worried that you come in my house. He said, well, this is what he said, and this is what he did that was interesting. I'm not worried that you should come in my house, but... I believe so. I believe that your authority, because he referred to Jesus as Lord, he said, look here, I believe that your divinity is such that if you just say it, it will come to pass. I've read this my whole life, but I just today understood this. If you just say it, some of us will go to the Lord but we don't trust God with the outcome. We give it to the Lord. And then we want to watch it the whole way. Let me see what God's doing. Let me see what he... I don't see God doing nothing. Wait a minute. What is God doing? He ain't moving fast enough. He said he was going to do it. I'm sitting here and ain't nothing happening. This man did not say, Jesus, come with me into my house for my servant be healed. I need to see you here. He said, Lord, if you just say it, I trust you with the outcome. I don't have to see what the end gonna be. I know that if you say it, it's going to be done. Can I tell somebody that's what real faith is? Real faith is not worried about what the doctor goes say. You know that God is already gonna work it out. Real faith is going to an interview and not saying, well, I don't know if I'm gonna get that job, but knowing that God can get you this job and make this one, there's another job waiting on you. Real faith means that you trust God with the outcome of your situation. That's what real faith is. Real faith is not clocking God. Real faith is trusting God. That God will do, is able to just say it and it's already done. In other words, God ain't got to show you how he's going to do it. In the reality, if he did tell us how he's going to do it, we still couldn't understand it because his ways are not our ways. So I've learned 
and just say, God, here it is. I'm going to let you work it out. If you just say it. If you just say it. Now, now, now and this is next verse. It's key to understanding why this man had this posture. He said, I'm a man that had folk under me too. He said, I'm a man that got authority. He said, if I tell my, my, my soldiers to do something, I ain't got to be worried about them doing it. Because power derives from above. He said, because I'm over them, guess what? I can just say it and it's done. And, and, and as a result of my understanding of that capacity, knowing, Lord, that you are from God, I believe that because God, it gives you authority, whatever you say, it will be done. I want somebody to understand that when you're talking to God, God doesn't have to go to nobody else to get approval to do what he's going to do in your life. God is at the top of the food chain. God is at the top of the charts. God is at the top, the apex of power. There's no power outside of his power. So when you go to the Lord, guess what? He can say it and it's already done. Somebody tell your neighbor, God is at the apex of power. I understand it. I understand all you got to do is say it. And it's already done. Say it. Just say it. No, just, just, if you just speak it. In, in Hebrews, put it in context for us. The worlds are held together by the power of his word. I was watching a movie one day and it was talking about the, 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 the solar system and how the planets and they move around in this constant order. And even every now and then when a, when a meteor or something seems out of order, even that meteor is within order. It's with under the power and authority of God. Everything that God says, it happens because everything is under his control and his authority. Now let's go just a little bit more. So if you really want to have true faith, you got to be humble. But then you got to, you got to trust God with the outcome. You can't, you can't give it to God and worry about it. And then it's, that, that ain't faith. That's just an exercise. You just exercise your lips. If you really, you got to say, God, I'm giving it to you. And if you just say it, it'll be done. And I'm just going to, I'm going to turn around and let you have it. So he says, Jesus, Jesus says, I'm coming here with you, man. He says, I'm an authority. You don't have to go nowhere. You ain't got to go do nothing. All you got to do is say it. It will happen. And when Jesus heard it, verse 10, the Bible said Jesus was amazed. Two times in the Bible, Jesus is amazed. One time he was amazed because of the lack of faith of the folk who were following him. The other time he was amazed by the amount of faith that somebody who didn't, wasn't even supposed to know him. Can I say one more time? His first amazement was at the folk who saw what he was able to do, didn't believe what he could do. And his other amazement was the time when somebody who wasn't supposed to know him didn't knew and believed he could do whatever he wanted to do. Let me contemporize this. He was amazed at folk who go to church every Sunday and who have been beneficiaries of the power of the Lord. But when a problem comes, they draw you on their nail and say, what God going to do? And he's amazed at somebody who walks to the church for the first time and give their lives over to Christ and say, God, have your way in my life. He was amazed. He said, I have not found so great faith in Israel. In the people who my father chose, the folk who were in bondage, but were brought out of bondage, the people who were brought safely through a sojourn through a land where it was hostile, the folk who went over on dry land in the Jordan River, the folk who were able to defeat enemies that were bigger than them every day, the folk who got They stepped back and didn't have the faith that this man had. Can I tell somebody, I got to do this right here. I got to pass it right here. Just going to church ain't going to get it. You got to have a relationship with God yourself. Because if you just go to church and go to church for going to church just because you want to say you were in church, when you go through a trial or a tribulation, all you know is church. But when you have a relationship with God and you call on the Lord every day of your life and you read the word every day of your life and when you study the word of God every day of your life, when you praise and worship, when you all by yourself.
yourself. When trouble comes, you know who to call. You don't call the church, you call on him who is able to keep you from falling. Don't come to church, but I'm saying allow church to edify your relationship with God. You said, "Yeah, man, this, this is going to be this right here is going to be tough. It's going to be very tight. This is about to get narrow, so so everybody tighten up." Verse eleven. Jesus said, "This I say to you: the men shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven." Jesus said, "This. This is what he said. He said, many folk." who are not part of my chosen people will be gathered together because of their faith like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they will be able to fellowship in the presence of the Lord. Why? Because they had faith. But on the other hand, verse 12, but the children of the kingdom, the folk who will call out to be God's chosen people, shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Can, can I talk about that for a second? In other words, some folk who got real faith will experience the beauty and the presence of the Lord. But some folk who just playing around, some folk who just playing church, some folk who just going through the motions, some folk who don't really love the Lord, some folk who don't really trust the Lord, they're going to look up and be outside of the presence of God, looking at some folk who are dirty and, and look like they wasn't about nothing and, and struggle with what they were going through, but they trusted God. It's hard. But Jesus said, in other words, our trust in God has to be authentic. authentic. It has to be real all the time in order for us to experience this celebration in the presence of the Lord. Jesus evaluated this thing. He said, look here. This man has come. He's got faith that I've not seen in my people. The synagogue ain't got nobody like this. He said, the temple ain't got nobody like this. He said, the elders... The scribes, the Pharisees, they ain't got nobody like this. The church ain't necessarily full of folk like this. I'm looking for some folk that don't have title. I'm looking for some folk who don't, are not about form or fashion. I'm looking for some folk who got the nitty gritty trust in God. He says, now as I look at this, I'm going to make a move. And Luke lets us know uh, that the folk who came for the man, uh, he came on behalf of the man that Jesus was sent back home. But here in Matthew says this right here. Jesus said to the centurion, he said, go thy way. And as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. What a powerful set of words. As a result of his humility, as a result of his trusting and believing and that God, Jesus, his capacity was such that he could just speak it. As a result of the fact that he was came before the Lord with the right posture, Jesus' response was, you know what? Just go on back. In the same way you believe enough to come to me in the first place, in the same way that I'm going to make it happen in your life. Can I tell somebody when you come to give it over to the Lord, you're going to leave it right there with the Lord? And the Lord is telling someone, just go. He's not selling us to stand there and watch him work. He said, just go and let me have it myself. I used to be kind of, I was, I, when I was a boy, I was really little, when they would come to me and ask for something, I didn't have to present them with any facts about how I was going to do it. Daddy, will you give me such says, yeah. And they would walk away smiling because they knew Daddy could take care of it. And sometimes when they didn't know it, I didn't know how I was going to do it. But I said it, and because I was Daddy, guess what? They believed me enough to walk off with a smile on their face. But when they get older, they want to know, I Daddy, can you get this? Yeah, well, what you going to use to get it? That's what happens when they get them older. They're right over there. They know what I'm talking about. But God wants us to have the posture of little children that we come to Dad and we say, Daddy, I'm standing in need of your blessing and, and, and I'm giving it over to you. And the Lord said, I already got it. And we walk out with a smile on our face. We walk out with praise on our lips. We walk out with joy in our heart because we know that Dad is going to happen. But let me tell you the difference between this dad and me and the earthly dad is in our father in heaven. Some stuff we got to wrestle.
wrestle with it. Something we ain't gonna be able to do. But my Father in heaven, Dad, can do whatever needs to be done. He can pick you up and he can turn you around. All you have to do is just go and walk away with the same belief that you had in your heart. And I want to tell St. Peter Baptist Church, you ought to have a foundation of belief in your life. There ought to be some stuff you believe in. When trouble comes my way, I have to step back and think about what I believe in. I believe that God made everything out of nothing. That helps me out, brothers and sisters. I believe that God said, let there be light and there was light. That helps me out when I'm in my darkness. I, I, I believe that God can give you bread from heaven. That helps me out with my broken, my pocket. I believe that God can give water from a rock. That helps me out when I'm in a dry place. I believe that God can take me over troubled waters. That helps me when trouble comes my way. I believe that God can do whatever he wants to do. That helps me when things look impossible. I believe that Jesus died and he got it with all power in his hand. That helps me when I'm feeling hopeless and helpless. I believe that Jesus sits at the right hand of God, living to make intercession for me. That helps me when I feel it all by myself. I believe that there's no problem too big for God. I believe that God is waiting on me to call on Him. I believe that God can answer any prayer. I believe God can heal my body. I believe God can bring me out of darkness. Sometimes when you're in trouble, just step back and say, I believe. I believe. I believe. And walk on with what you believe. And watch what God will do. He will change your situation. He will change your circumstance. He will change your outlook. He will change your mindset. And all you will do is walk off knowing that God has got it already worked out. I don't know about you, but I'm glad I serve a God who would tell me to go. I'm glad I serve a God who would tell me to go now, boy. I got this already worked out. I'm glad I serve a God who don't need my help in no situation. I'm glad I serve a God who is able to do abundantly, seating above whatever I ask of thee. I'm glad. He's able. Tell your neighbor, he's able. He's able. He's able. Somebody say like you mean he's able. He's able to do anything. He's able to pick you up. He's able to turn you around. He's able to put your feet on solid ground. He is able to bring you back. He is able to bring you through. He is able to heal your body. To change your situation. He is able. He's a. He's a. He's a. I know what Joshua was talking about now. Joshua said, Look at people in this room. Let's look at what God has done. Everything he promised, he brought it to pass. And if you look back over your life, you realize everything God promised, he brought it to pass. Is there anybody in this place today that can look back over your life and say, God did, God did, God did, God did that, God did that, God did that. Well, if you can look back over your life and realize that God did it, I want you to look ahead and know that God feel bad in your body, but it says that God, I'm trusting you with it. I'm giving it over to you. I know that all you got to do is say it, 
and it's done because your power is unmatched. Let that change our lives. Let it change our prayer lives. The God I'm trusting you with. Father God, in the name of Jesus, in the name of who is able, we come right now, Lord, to say thank you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for your joy. And thank you, Lord, for the promises that are packed up in your word. Thank you, Lord, for what you have loaded in your word. It allows us to walk this walk, knowing that you're able to do whatever needs to be done. God, I pray for all of us right now to have a spirit of humility, a spirit of brokenness, that each time we come to you, we don't come to you trying to tell you what to do. But instead, we come to you with humble requests on our heart, placing it before you. And I pray, God, that we will come not trying to figure out and try to, to, to determine how you're going to do it, but to know that all you got to do is say it and it's already done. And I pray, God, you give us a ghost spirit, a spirit of going, a spirit that allows us to walk away knowing that you got it worked out, a spirit that allows us not to look back and worry about what's going on and what's happened, but instead know that the same way you've done it, you will do it again. Let it be so. In Jesus' name, we say thank you for this moment in time. And we pray, God, that our hearts will be stirred, strengthened, and fixed. In Jesus' name, we say thank you, Lord. And amen. Let us all stand all over the building just for a moment. Just for a moment of decision.